Since 1715, when Giuseppe Tartini, the founder of the Romantic School of Music, first visited with Antonio Stradivari in his shop and ordered the violin that he would play upon for the rest of his life, the school has taught that the more a violinist knows about their instrument, how it's made, and how it's repaired, the better. And it is so rare that a master violin is so original, yet so much in need of cleaning, that I have spent the last couple days rigging up a GoPro with a magnifying lens so that you could learn all of the different procedures for cleaning and protecting a fine violin for yourself. You see, it's one thing to watch a violin maker or a connoisseur perform this operation. It's an entirely different experience seeing it for yourself through their eyes. I hope that you find that it was worth the effort. Not only is this instrument quite filthy, inside and out, and covered in places with a thick cake of rosin. Someone got carried away with their hill peg compound. <laughs> but all of this will only add to our experience and ultimate satisfaction, for this truly is a visual diamond in the rough. We start with an old but clean 100% cotton t-shirt. You can cut it with scissors, but a cutting mat is so much quicker and easier. You'll need a large piece to wipe off your instrument and keep in your violin case. But for cleaning and polishing, you'll need quite a few pieces between two and a half and three inches, or six and seven and a half centimeters. The exact size varies upon the size of your fingers, so don't cut out too many at the beginning. Loose rosin dust needs to be wiped off each day when you're done playing. And if you follow this rule, it usually wipes off easily and your instrument usually remains clean. Yet, over the years, it will start to collect, no matter how diligent you are. Especially on a fine violin like this that has never had its surface French polished with a harder, smoother spirit varnish composed mostly of shellac. What has surprised most musicians and violin makers over the years is that the upper Cremonese varnish is tender and wears away quickly in the hands of a professional musician. Also, that rosin dust loves to stick to it and will become part of the varnish over the years, making it appear dull and ordinary. If not cleaned properly, the varnish can be dulled forever, as Paganini's Guarnerius was or in other cases, ruined completely. Part of my incentive for making this video is to keep this from ever happening again. If you can't remove the rosin by wiping it with a clean dry cloth, the next step is to blow a little moisture onto the rosin to help soften it so you can wipe it away more easily. And this can be done on any instrument. The next level of cleaning requires a small amount of Yoha varnish cleaner. But before you do this, or any of the other processes in this video, it is necessary to flick all of the lint off and out of the cotton squares. And make sure to do this away from the bench and the instrument. For almost any ordinary violin, a bit of Yoha cleaner and a little patience once or twice a year is all you need to clean your instrument properly. Almost all the other cleaners will either build up on the surface and start collecting rosin more than ever, or they will dissolve a fine varnish over time. Regardless, always be careful, take your time, and don't let any get on the strings. Yes, it requires a bit of time, but it's usually well worth the effort. And the cloth should only show black or gray, which will be rosin removed from the surface. Any other color means that you're removing varnish, and you should stop immediately. 
but most of this rosin has become part of the varnish and it will take a special technique to remove it. And for training purposes, in order to demonstrate every technique possible, I've decided to do everything, start to finish, including the French polishing, without removing the strings or dropping the sound post. I will just need to remove the tailpiece, which is absolutely necessary because it's physically clamped and covers part of the belly in the back. When using a tailpiece wrench without a built-in stop though, always be careful to never put it in far enough to scratch the rib. This violin looks like it came very close to disaster because if you don't keep the raw edges French polished, as we're going to do later on in this video, they can get snagged on clothing like this one did. And the owner is very lucky that the edge didn't break off. I always start cleaning out the corners with a large one inch soft brush. In other words, gentle first. But as I figured, I will need to work my way down to a smaller, shorter, stiffer brush and give that a try and see what it does. And no surprise, I will mainly end up using a very small, stiff bristle brush. But be careful to stay on the dirt and the rosin and try to never touch or scratch the varnish when you use a stiff brush. I am listing pretty much every product that I use in this video and where to find each one in the YouTube description of this video. Because many times, finding the right tools and supplies is more than half the battle. At the same time, when it comes to violin making and restoration, many of my favorite tools are homemade. For those who decide to get serious about violin restoration, the best book out there was written by Hans Weissar and Margaret Shipman. Hans was always courteous and a great help when my father and I visited with him. And he had the ability and took the time to explain things right. But brace yourself, usually any wonderful book about fine violins will not be inexpensive. With the possible exception of Two Trees by Kevin Lee Luthier. Okay, I just couldn't help myself. It looks like the bridge has been moved recently, but it's in the correct position now and we'll work around it. If you run into little chunks of rosin, it's best to cut them off so the varnish doesn't come off with them. I usually use a small X-Acto blade that I have rounded and sharpened myself. And this feels like a piece of painter epoxy, but it doesn't matter. Whatever you find, just carefully cut it off. Make sure to get everywhere and remove all of the loose rosin that you possibly can. Some of this is a bit awkward while wearing an Optivisor and a GoPro mounted in front of your face. <laughs> Since this brush was about a dollar, when the bristles bend out, I just cut them off so they don't end up scratching the varnish. And when all of the corners and crevices are clean, wipe everything off again with a soft, clean cotton cloth. Next, we look over the edges for any rosin that's collected on the raw wood, because we need to remove it with denatured alcohol before doing anything else. I apply the alcohol with a squeeze bottle. And as you can tell, I'm still trying to get used to the GoPro. <laughs> After applying the alcohol, 
make sure there's not too much by squeezing it between your fingers because one tiny stray drip of alcohol can destroy the value of a fine violin. No one should begin cleaning any violin with alcohol without close expert supervision. Possibly unless you have a really cheap violin you don't mind throwing away when you're finished. Yet every violinist should know how it's done. If the rosin doesn't come off the first time, find a fresh moist spot on the cotton and try it again. This back corner worries me because it looks like someone touched it up with something synthetic without removing the rosin first. Also, you shouldn't use any cleaner other than alcohol before sealing up the wood, or it usually seals whatever is on the wood into the wood forever, which makes this violin an even better example because it's not coming off. And now we're going to have to get really serious. And the other back corner has the same problem, just not as bad. I use 4 aught steel wool, which is about as fine as it gets. Preferably stainless steel so it doesn't rust, and make sure that it doesn't have any oil in it. Don't abrade the instrument any more than you absolutely have to. Just take off the surface. And if there's a little darkness left behind, so be it. Also, be careful not to touch any other part of the instrument with the steel wool. Okay, no surprise, even though it's worn a little bit and hard to tell, they did it here also. Clean off every last particle of steel wool and it's time to pull out the touch-up varnish and seal all of the edges that have raw wood showing. This is what touch-up varnish looks like without any colorant. This one has a slight amount of brown, orange, and red mixed in. While this one is thicker, and has even more colorant, which will probably match the top color of the varnish. While this one is a little thinner again, yet it's the darkest of all. I will be doing a complete video on how to make these wonderful, almost magical mixtures in the near future, so watch for the announcement on Instagram or Facebook if you don't get it here on YouTube. Since the edges of a violin should always be lighter than the rest of the instrument, I'll start with the lightest color first. Just a couple drops in the cotton gets you started. Maple is much more forgiving than the spruce, so always start with the back and begin by using quick, light swipes. And if it looks good, which it almost always will, because this really is wonderful stuff, when you're finished with the back, move on to the belly. 
And just remember that the edges of the spruce are much more absorbent. So don't use touch-up varnish that's too dark. I'll put a little extra varnish on this next edge because it would normally be considered borderline whether to fill or trim it. But this touch-up varnish will both fill and bond small voids and help hold the wood together at the same time. But whatever you do, be extremely careful going against the grain at the beginning or you might snag the wood and break a piece off. Don't worry if the color is a little light right now. It needs the darker varnish over it later on to match the instrument and look right. Also, be careful not to get any on the rosin that we will be removing later. If the varnish accumulates and gets gooey, just rub it into the cloth and add a little alcohol. You can start a second coat about the time you finish the first one and everything will begin to look so much better. Because of all the peg dope smeared on the surface and into the raw wood, the scroll of this instrument is a completely different story. So I'll put the varnish cloth away with a few drops of alcohol to keep it moist and let the touch up varnish dry for a while. I start the operation with a round toothpick. Cut to a chisel shape and I use it to carefully peel off as much of the peg dope as I can. Patience is definitely a virtue on a project like this but the beauty of this part is there is a secret. You see while alcohol doesn't dissolve hill peg dope, Yoha Varnish Cleaner does. And while I normally never suggest putting any cleaner on raw wood, I will simply have to rely upon the magical qualities of this touch-up varnish to make up for it. And yes, I really will show you how it's made for absolutely free. Just like all the music lessons, violin making lessons, sheet music and flashcards, and in the near future, music videos from the Romantic School of Music. When you have as much peg dope scraped off as you can without harming the varnish underneath, it's time to pull out the Yoha cleaner again. It really does a nice job dissolving the rosin and especially the peg dope. It even pulls quite a bit of it out of the raw wood, so we'll just keep going. If you can't get into a particular spot very well, use your imagination. I use these tiny Q-tips all the time. And when you're finished, wipe everything off the best you can. And just maybe, there might really be a fabulous, beautiful scroll underneath it all. After getting a feel for the touch-up varnish while doing the edges and making sure that the color is right, it's time for the larger patches of bare wood while always taking care to stay off the rosin. Move quickly and lightly, and it's always better to have less varnish in the cloth than too much, and it's better to be too thin 
than too thick. For those not aware, old instruments were originally made with thicker, shorter necks, and they were lengthened, usually in the early to mid-1800s, by laminating a block of wood to the heel and then resetting it, or, much more commonly, with a neck graft, like this one. To help compensate for using the Yoha cleaner on bare wood, I'm going to use the thick, darker touch-up varnish for the rest of the scroll, at least this first time around. A lot of these kinds of decisions simply come from experience. And if you don't have it, <laughs> you shouldn't dive into an instrument like this one, at least until you have a chance to practice on quite a few inexpensive ones first. I love this part, because with all of the rosin gone, and the ability to gloss it over, it's finally beginning to look like a finished work of art. Since we now have the darker touch-up varnish in the cotton, I'm going to go over the lighter areas of the edges of the violin to help match the color better and to build up more thickness to help protect it from what's coming next. As you probably noticed earlier, alcohol dissolves rosin. And you should start with cleaning the fingerboard first to get a feel for just how quickly it really can, since the rosin on the fingerboard will be the most recent and quickest to remove. Once again, squeeze the cloth between your fingers to make absolutely sure that no alcohol will drip onto the instrument when you apply pressure. And now be extra careful to not touch anything but the fingerboard while cleaning it. Pull your hands apart and apply pressure. And unless the rosin is really old, it will usually melt right off. Unless you have gut strings, a little alcohol on the underside shouldn't hurt them. If you are a serious violinist and play in the highest positions, you should make it a point to learn this skill so you never have to suffer with a sticky fingerboard. I unfold the cotton cloth so I can get up higher underneath the strings. To get the rosin off of the end of the fingerboard requires a stick to support the cotton. I use a leftover piece of lining. It looks like there's a little really old rosin left at the edges, so I will repeat the operation until it's gone. And don't forget to clean the sides of the fingerboard, and you can do it either with or without the stick. Then double check everything and clean off any stray rosin that you may have missed. This next operation is usually never done without removing the strings, but sometimes I love a challenge because even the very finest ebony is not really a solid, completely smooth, dense, pure black. The finest, like this fingerboard, comes close, but not quite. So we need to fill the pores with 
extra blackened stained ebony dust to give it that perfect look. The Minwax won't dissolve the varnish anything like the alcohol, but once again, be careful not to touch anything but the fingerboard. Work it in the best you can under the strings and as far up as you can within reason. Next, spread it around and wipe it down with a clean cotton cloth. This is much easier <laughs> when there's no strings on the violin. And then wipe everything off the best you can. And that's pretty much it. We now get really serious because alcohol will dissolve almost any varnish, whether oil or spirit, very quickly. The game is to dissolve the rosin off the surface of the varnish before dissolving the varnish. The way to do this is to move very quickly with a medium amount of pressure. Then, constantly checking the cotton for the color of the varnish. As long as it's black or gray, you're okay. And if so, keep removing the rosin fairly quickly because each swipe will be softening the varnish underneath. Also, make sure that you don't mistakenly grab the instrument with your other fingers if they have any leftover alcohol on them. I'm constantly moving to a fresh place on the cotton, adding more alcohol, and then rubbing it against my other palm to spread the alcohol around and to be absolutely sure that there isn't too much. Turn the cotton over, it'll still have a little alcohol in it and it seems to act even better. But just the slightest hesitation or too much pressure will quickly begin taking off varnish. If you look close, you can see some color mixed in with the gray. Not a disaster in this case. Yet now we know just how delicate this varnish really is. The thick areas require even more pressure and quicker strokes, so be extra careful. Sometimes the cotton works even better when folded back over on itself and I constantly experiment with different amounts and widths of layers depending upon where I am on the violin. In the end, the very slightest hint of color is perfection because this actually helps bring the original varnish back to life. I thought that I would show a few seconds of the more traditional view that an apprentice gets while learning to clean a master violin this way. And it makes me glad that I spent the extra effort. This may look all right as entertainment value goes, but it doesn't show you what you really need to know.
Make sure to go over every surface of the instrument, even if it doesn't look like there's any rosin. Because on an instrument like this, there will be. Normally the back and ribs of a violin are fairly rosin free, but not this one. Like I said before, this violin is a great example for just about everything. Now, for the hard part. And in this one case, when I compared the footage, this really was the better view. And I did speed up a lot of the footage so it wouldn't take half an hour. My advice is to keep moving on the instrument, keep moving to a fresh place on the cotton, and keep watching diligently for the slight color of varnish, which will sometimes come all at once. And what at first looked like it would be impossible, <laughs> and it really is impossible if you don't know the proper way of doing it, is now beautiful. You can also see I used the cotton wrapped around the piece of wood to get all the little places and under things where you couldn't get normally. To get really into the corners, I angle the end of the piece of lining under the cotton. But everything else I said so far still applies. If the instrument does have a neck graft, don't be surprised if a little touch-up varnish comes off on the cotton while working in the corners. <laughs> I've seen just about anything used after some makers replace a neck, but it's not a problem, even if it dissolves before the rosin, because later on, we will be putting on a little touch-up varnish ourselves, and ours will be the correct kind. Yet, be as careful as you can, especially when moving away from the corners and on to the original varnish. These little ridges seem to disappear just like magic. And the violin at this point is beginning to come back to life.
Yes, I could take the bridge off by using a string lifter and make this operation a little quicker and easier. Yet there are times when the customer loves the sound and response of their instrument so much that they don't want anything moved or changed. And I do love a challenge anyway, so this is how it's done. It's a little crude, but I like my homemade light better than anything on the market because it's so small and flexible. And with it, we can begin to see just how filthy this instrument is inside, including a typical hairball, which is not uncommon, though usually it's up against an end block and you have to roll the instrument back and forth until you can see it easily through one of the F holes. My extraction tool is a simple piece of wire, sharpened and bent on one end. To clean out everything else inside the violin, I use this. Small pieces of 18 gauge multi-strand wire. I cut it to about seven and a half millimeter or just over a quarter of an inch long. It's not that critical, but it seems to work the best for me. Some people use rice, but after seeing all the worm damage in so many otherwise fine old violins, I never felt good about putting anything edible in any musical instrument. Others use small pieces of plastic so it doesn't scratch the instrument. Yet the plastic never seems to have enough weight to really accomplish the deal. You see, the copper inside the wire makes it just right, and it only takes a minute or two of swishing to wipe everything off of the surfaces inside that you don't want. Move it around as much as you can so it also rubs the inside of the belly. And make sure you get every one of the pieces out. The real time spent here is shaking out all of the particles knocked loose by the wires. The angle of the light doesn't really show it very well, but there was a lot of crud inside this old violin. I blow into it and tap it quite a few times, and even what you're seeing here is edited. This has been a big project, but we're now headed down the home stretch, and it's time to pull out the thick, dark, touch-up varnish again. It may look pretty grubby on the tip of this squeeze bottle, but it really is wonderful, and a little alcohol is all it takes to make it any consistency that we want. I really do get into it, and I do anything it takes to even the varnish out and to feel that the varnish in the cloth is just right. My only thoughts or advice at this point is that when you actually start using touch-up varnish, most people quickly get a good feel for it. And, as always, start with the edges where it's the most forgiving. It's like magic, and the real goal is not to make the varnish appear perfectly even and new. It's to protect it while making the instrument look wonderful by keeping all of the natural beauty of the wear patterns. The best way to learn what a master violin should look like is to study as many of them as you can in person, or at least look at as many high quality color photographs as you possibly can. Because even though each instrument is unique, you will begin to see consistent patterns and develop your own taste and preferences when the time comes. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> this is where I have to apologize for a minute because I thought that the GoPro was recording, but it wasn't. During this process, it's better to be a little too dry than too wet. Move quickly and never stop moving while the cloth is in contact with the surface of the instrument. The goal with French polishing is to put a very thin layer of varnish over the entire surface of the instrument to bring out the luster and help keep rosin from sticking to it in the future. The varnish does dry quickly, so you can turn the instrument around and do about anything you want as you move along. Make sure every part of the instrument has been touched with the varnish. The same rules apply here as everywhere else. Never stop moving when you're on the varnish itself. If you run into a little bit lighter area that looks a little strange, it's fine to go back over it a second time later and build up just a little more color until it looks right. But for the most part, this is simply enjoyable, relaxing, and Beautiful. On most instruments, this is where we would normally go through the traditional steps of French polishing with a rubbing pad. And I will cover that process in a separate video. But because this violin has such an original flavor and has never been French polished before, I will be finishing it with what is referred to as a natural French polish, which is accomplished by dripping a few drops of alcohol onto, once again, a soft cotton cloth, wadding it up to distribute the alcohol evenly, flicking out all the lint as we always should do. And then, when the moisture level is almost gone, quickly rubbing the surface. I've sped this part up because it's the same all over the instrument. When the cloth accumulates any touch-up varnish, flip it over if there's still moisture in it. But if it's dry, use a fresh piece of cotton. Never add alcohol to a used cloth. And you should expect to use over 10 pieces of cotton for this process alone. You can touch things up as you go, or after you've finished the entire instrument. But if you do decide to go over the entire surface a second time, which usually isn't necessary, wait a few hours before you do. But don't get tempted to go over any touch-up varnish a third time, or the surface will almost always get rough. This technique has more effect than you might imagine, and it works on almost any clean instrument. And now we can finally see what is called the dichromatic qualities of the famous Cremonese varnish. On the scroll, you don't have to reach absolutely everywhere. Since we just applied fresh touch-up varnish, the faint fumes will gloss the surfaces in the corners and give it that natural, beautiful, coveted sheen. And on a fine instrument like this, 
that perfect, exquisite balance of art and age. Okay, I know I get carried away, but can you blame me? 